Hello, testing, one, two.
those meeting minutes for the purpose of the purpose of approval by the body of the minutes or semi-annual review of the minutes as mandated by section 3.06. The appointment, employment, compensation, and discipline performance or dismissal of specific employees of the district or legal counsel for the district. Litigation when an action against affecting on our behalf of the particular district has been filed and is pending before a court or administrative tribunal. The sale or purchase of securities, investments, or investment contracts. Security procedures and the use of personnel and equipment to respond to an actual, a threatened, or a reasonably potential danger to the safety of employees, students, staff, the public, or the public property. The setting of a price for sale or lease of property owned by the di district. Collective negotiating matters between the district and its employees or their representatives. Can I have a motion to come out of closed session, please? I move to come out of closed session. A motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Well, good evening and welcome to the uh, October 19th business meeting. And there's no mission. Oh, there it is. And <laughs> our, our mission is to educate students to be self-directed learners, collaborative <laughs> workers, complex thinkers, quality producers, and community contributors. Roll call, please, Ms. Bell. Sure. Student ambassadors present, Kevin Angel, Abby Rader, board members, Jackie Romberg, Kristen Fitzgerald, Susan Price, Terry Fielden, Susan Crotty, Donna Wonky, and Mike Gensch. Okay, could uh, everybody stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? It's going to be given to us by Ellsworth Elementary. Our microphones are a little down right now. Okay. So you have to use your outside players. We will use our outside voices. Welcome, everyone. We have some of our fifth grade students from Ellsworth Elementary. I am Cheryl DeGan, and I'm the principal. Leah Losted, Eric Muller, Avery Stein, Sammy Davies, Jenny Garcia. Please stand. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If there are parents of these students who would like to come into the open area to take a picture of them, that's you're more than welcome to do that. Please come on in. One second. Slide these out of the way. You got, you got, the old ones work. Oh. <laughs> so, good news. Oh, is it working? Oh, ah, excellent. So now we're on to good news. <laughs> all right, some of our good news. Uh, first of all, it's my pleasure to report that uh, there was a, a team of us that attended the Illinois State Board of Education those who excel awards uh, in Bloomington Normal, Illinois over the weekend. Uh, District 203 was well represented. Among those being recognized by the State Board of Education for uh, the work that they do in their various positions include uh, Veronica Zamora, Aaron Stablin, Rob Summer, Sue Hubbard, the Kennedy Junior High School School Family Community Partnership Team, and of course our very own Tim Moranga. So congratulations to all of those who represented this district. and others who are nominated but are unable to attend. But it's uh, nice to be recognized for the outstanding work that these people do uh, and these groups do uh, for the students in our school district. Now I'd like to invite uh, Principal Weisbrook, Principal Posey to come forward and help me with our first recognition. Uh, the National Merit Corporation announced that 38 students from District 203 are semifinalists in the 61st Annual National Merit Scholarship Program. These students have the opportunity then to continue in the competition for scholarships that will be offered to them in the spring. They're among the 16,000 highest scores across the nation. The National Merit Scholarship Program is an academic competition for recognition and scholarships that began in 1955. 
high school students enter the National Merit Program by taking the preliminary SAT, National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test, a test which serves as an initial screen of approximately 1.5 million entrants each year. And by meeting published program entry and participation requirements, so these are among the best and the brightest. And congratulations to all of these students. And we'll begin by recognizing those students from Naperville Central High School. Thank you. Um, I'm very proud of these students. Uh, uh, it's a terrific accomplishment and uh, extra proud of the effort that I know that it takes to get this achievement in this award. And I'm sure that friends and family of these students are also very proud. So it's my privilege to uh, introduce some of these students. A few might be absent, probably home studying, doing homework, and uh, preparing. Uh, first is our student ambassador, Kevin Angel. Next is Deborah Chain. I don't think she's here, but let's clap for her anyway. <laughs> Next is Tiffany Chen. <laughs> Tiffany, we're also going to wish you luck. I know Tiffany has advanced uh, in the <laughs> uh, state tennis singles. Uh, state tournament that's upcoming. Uh, next is Cole Hook.
again. You kind of squeeze in just a little bit. There we go. Perfect. Very nice. All right, guys. Say cheese. Okay, we do have one more uh, group of students to recognize. Uh, every month, we take this opportunity to recognize students who exemplify and model the district's mission statement. You heard Board President Field and read that at the beginning of it. We open every board meeting with uh, reciting our mission statement. Uh, but we look for students who are in remarkable ways doing things every single day that really exemplify each of the strands of the mission. And tonight, we're going to recognize three students from Naperville Central High School. Uh, and Mr. Weisbrook will join me in just a minute. But uh, Abby Renfro, Maggie O'Brien, and Allie Wenzel, if you'll come forward, please. <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about what they did and then ask if one of them or all three of them would like to say something, and then we'll have them pose for our pictures as well. Uh, but these three students attended an assembly at Hinsdale Central High School in February. The guest speaker was Chris Heron, whose message helps students prevent addiction and or overcome addiction. They were very impressed and felt that the Naperville Central High School Committee would benefit from this powerful message. They arranged for a meeting with Mrs. Neven, Dean of Intervention, and presented the idea of bringing Chris Heron to Naperville Central High School. These young women contacted and found sponsors willing to donate money to pay for Heron's appearance, designed flyers, and participated in planning the details of the assembly that was from what I understand, very successfully held in Naperville Central High School on October 6th. So congratulations to the three of you for modeling the, the mission statement or the mission strands of self-directed learners, collaborative workers, and community contributors. Congratulations. <laughs> Somebody want to talk a little bit about what you... Um, we just would like to say thank you to everyone who helped Chris Heron come to Naperville Central and also would like to thank you guys for uh, letting us have this award. Thank you.
Is it working? Is it working or no? Yeah, excellent. Okay, if there's anybody, uh, if there's any parents remaining from the awards who'd like to leave, you're certainly free to do that, or you can stay for the rest of the meeting as well. On to um, public comment. I don't have any cards, but there's any, if there's any member of the public who would like to address the board, there's three minutes for an individual speaker, five minutes for a group. If anybody would like to come up and speak. No? Okay, great. We'll go on to communications. And the first up is the student ambassadors report. Who's, uh, who's first tonight? Kevin? So this, pa this past, is that working? Okay. This past Wednesday, Naperville Central administered the PSAT for the first time during the school day. Um, usually it's on a Saturday, um, so not during class time. And that, I'm happy to report that it went successfully and went very smoothly. Um, in addition, we had parent-teacher conferences last week, and Naperville Central student ambassadors volunteered to help guide the parents around to make sure that went smoothly and parents could find where they were going. Uh, also last Thursday, it was an institute day for teachers, and they were taught how to use a software called Hapara, which is an educational software that lets teachers monitor what, kids are, uh, what tabs kids have open on their computers, as well as provide feedback on what they're doing and uh, guide them to a specific website. So Central will be implementing that in order to help teachers uh, implement, uh, use, the tech use the Chromebooks efficiently. Um, also, as far as sports news from Naperville Central, uh, girls tennis, they competed in sectionals last Friday. Um, Tiffany Chen won the sec uh, sectional singles tournament and is advancing to the state competition. In addition, Sabrina Chow and Hannah Swarm, a team of doubles, is also advancing to the state competition. Girls and boys cross country both competed in conference last Friday, and they will compete in regionals this week. And then finally, marching band competed in the state competition this past week and goes on to compete in the Marching Bands of America Fall Championship this Saturday in Indianapolis. So like San... Lake Central um, North hosted the PSAT for the first time during the school day as required by the National Board. Um, it interrupted their late arrival, so I'm sure the juniors weren't too thrilled, but it went, um, it went well. Um, we, had, we are having ECG screening on October 22nd for students who um, choose to participate, um, as well as um, we have our NHS induction on November 4th, and we're hosting the Science Olympiad on October our November 6th and our career in Carnival Week is in two weeks so November 9th. Um, girls Golf um, won fourth in state and um, last week was homecoming week so we had activities like bubble soccer. I'm proud to say that my team won. <laughs> um, and we had student faculty basketball, Mr. NHS, and we won our first football game. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you. Okay, on to written communications. They're there for uh, the viewing. Superintendent sca Staff School Reports. And Abby, at the risk of getting myself in trouble with my partner on the other side of town in District 204, it's always nice to get that win against the District 204 school. Uh, diversity Committee Report. There's a brief written report provided for the Board of Education. Um, the Diversity Committee held its first meeting of the school year on Monday, October 12th. Uh, the committee itself is comprised of approximately 30 members, uh, which include both District 203 staff members and community members and um, parents in our district. Uh, Mrs. Crotty and Mrs. Romberg serve as the board's liaisons to the committee this year. Uh, the first meeting on October 12th was really broad. We, we focused with uh, really a reminder of our norms and the purpose for this, this committee's meeting. We then uh, asked for feedback regarding the inaugural Welcome to 203 event that was held back in August, which was uh, an outcome of last year's diversity uh, advisory committee. And then uh, we did a brief uh, overview of the state of the district, and I referred participants to uh, sites on our website where they could review a video that was produced that uh, provides a broad overview. And then we had a conversation about areas of focus for future meetings. Dr. Osborne facilitated an activity that allowed uh, participants to identify uh, areas on which they would like to uh, have a little bit more uh, focus as part of the Diversity Advisory Committee. Our next meeting will be held on Wednesday, November 18th at 7 o'clock here. 
uh, at PSAC and we'll be focusing on culturally responsive practices I, as identified in our strategic blueprint 216D. And then the committee will also then look at their feedback that they provided us from the last meeting and identify topics for our future meetings in February, March, and April. Again, this is, uh, this is one of my favorite committees. They uh, engage in very frank, straightforward conversation, not afraid to, to provide input uh, and feedback to us as, uh, as an administration and, and Board of Education. So I'll take any questions that you have. So it's been a while since I've been on that committee, and I have to really compliment um, you and your staff that were there. It's really taken on that higher level thinking that we talk about. It's, it's gone. It's just seeing the iterations and how that it's a useful group for feedback to the community. And I love the think, pair, share um, exercise as well that you that you did. But it's really nice that they're another source of reflection for you to bounce ideas off of. And they were so forthcoming with ideas. Um, you can see the trust in the room. And you know, it, it was really, the two-way communication was great. One of the great. things I'm really pleased of with this committee is the, the sense of trust that we've committed uh, to each other to have a safe place to have conversation. And, and I think our own admission that we're not doing everything as well as we can. And we need their, we need their very explicit, very clear feedback in order to get better. So thank you. Um, what I thought was so unique, and I, I know you mentioned this, the staff, the teachers, the staff, and the administrators that were there, that it, it, it's, it's that whole combination um, that really made it really special, really authentic. So awesome job. Okay, 6.05, I'll invite uh, our presenters to come forward. Uh, as uh, the Board of Education and our community is aware, one of our large initiatives this year is our digital learning initiative. Uh, and uh, because of the investment that we've made in this initiative, it's important that we keep you updated along the way. Uh, and so tonight we're going to provide you with our first update uh, in, in the implementation of our digital learning initiative for this year. And our Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Jennifer Hester, and our Chief Information Officer, Roger Brunell, uh, will take the brunt of the presentation. Uh, and then uh, they, along with uh, the rest of staff, any questions that you may have, uh, uh, we'll be able to address. Again, this is an update. Uh, it is uh, kind of how things have gone up to this point, all the way from the implementation the or the approval by the Board of Education last May into the beginning of implementation this fall. So I'll turn it over to the team. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you tonight. The outcomes of the presentation are to review our digital learning uh, initiative implementation strategy and to provide an update on the digital learning initiative progress to date. Um, it's important to note that you'll be hearing updates on our professional learning plan. You'll be hearing updates on um, uh, everything with our device strategy. Um, what we will not be sharing is an update that details implementation data. So basically data that would be collected on implementation in the classrooms. So we'll be able to prepare some or share some uh, anecdotal information with that, but not data because it would be too early for that. Um, so uh, just to note, there are so many exciting things that are going on in our schools because of this initiative. And Roger and I would love uh, to do nothing more than have several in teacher, teachers in front of you tonight to talk about the shifts in instruction and the multiple ways that they're engaging our students. Um, I'm sure our two student representatives could share some information as well. Um, so instead, I'm sorry, but you're stuck with the two of us. Mm -hmm. And we're going to provide you with a district level update and then uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll let you know of an opportunity where you can come and hear from some of our teachers and our students. The two blueprint commitments that support the Digital Learning Initiative are Commitment 116F and 3.18C. 116F is our commitment to meet students' learning needs through providing both online and blended learning opportunities. We believe that online and blended learning will prepare our students for college and career experiences. These learning opportunities allow students to have control over the pace, place, and time of their learning, and they increase students' abilities to become self-directed uh, self learners, collaborative workers, and global contributors. Online courses or access to addition, additional curriculum content in the blended environment increase district resources available to serve students and create efficiencies in those resources. 
318C is a commitment to implement a student-focused, achievable, and sustainable digital learning strategy. The strategy supports online and blended learning designs as it provides students with universal access to digital curriculum, technology, tools, and ecosystems that are effectively integrated into the teaching and learning experience. So together, both of these commitments strive to increase student engagement. They support teachers with dif differentiating instruction so that learning can become more personalized. They provide opportunities to increase collaboration in the classroom and communication uh, within the classroom and beyond the four walls of the classroom. The two blueprint commitments provide access to a wealth of, we of resources and content, and they open opportunities for students to create and share their work, their thinking, and the quality products that they produce. In May of 2015, the Board of Education approved a three-year implementation plan for digital learning. I'm going to provide a brief overview of the three-year implementation plans. So for this school year, we are implementing our digital learning expectations with Chromebooks and Google Apps for Education at the high school level. The junior high schools are expanding their work with the digital learning, and the elementary pilot is still continuing. In 2016-2017, the digital learning expectations will be implemented at the junior high level. Google Apps for Education were recommended for grades six through eight with Chromebooks in a one-to-one -one ratio. We will also continue our digital learning pilot at the elementary level while our junior high schools are in the first year of implementation. And then finally, in year three, the year 2017-2018, uh, we, rec uh, we recommended and will implement at the elementary level. Apple was the recommended ecosystem for grades K through two using the Apple iPad in a two to one environment. And the recommendations for grades three through five was to conduct further study of the Google, the Google ecosystem and Chromebooks and of the Apple ecosystem with the <coughs> iPads as the device. So just a reminder um, of the year one expectations. Um, the initial expectations and for teaching and learning have been included in all professional learning for high school teachers as well as teachers at the elementary and the junior high digital learning expansion. Just as a reminder, the first three expectations for teaching and learning were generated from the International Society for Technology and Education Standards. You've also heard those referred to as ISTE standards. For and those standards are for teachers and students. And we'd like to highlight that digital citizenship has been one of our major goals within those first three expectations. The fourth expectation is related to quality instruction in transformative and blended learning practices. Um, so before I move on with the technology um, expectations, I just want to take a, min a moment for some, some brief anecdotes here. Um, I would say that all you have to do right now is walk into one of our high schools and you will see the Chromebooks out. Um, you will see a level of collaboration and engagement that is different than the past. You will see uh, students collaborating both um, through technology, through the tools that have been made available, but you, I think you'll also see a degree mm -hmm. of um, personalized and face-to-face -face communication um, that, that may not have existed before. Um, you will... Um, You'll hear stories or um, actually see teachers collaborating on a different level as they're sharing ways that they're helping students meet their learning goals, either through the tools and the technology. And if you think about these expectations, when we presented them, we said that they had to be something that was doable for teachers so that we could have a high level of implementation. And I would say that we definitely have teachers who are using the tools for substitution, so just replacing. Uh, the technology with paper and pencil. Um, I would definitely argue that we have teachers who are augmenting, so enhancing, but then I would also say, as we've talked before, they're also going above the line, where you might see students doing work um, in a way that was not made possible before the one-to-one -one environment was introduced into the high schools. So that's just a, a brief uh, antidote there. And then if I move along to the technology, the technology expectations focus on efficient deployment of the devices, and they also aim to provide timely technology and system support for students and staff. 
So during the second school year following deployment for each of the grade level spans, so next year for high school, expectations will move towards more transformation of the learning environment with teachers increasing their levels of expertise in the use of technology and tools. As teachers build knowledge and expertise, we see them facilitating more personalized learning experiences for our students that translate into increased, into increased student engagement, benefits in the area of creative thinking, innovative approaches and heightened capabilities in collaboration, content creation versus content consumption, communication and development of deeper knowledge in subject areas. So now we'll move into more of the update. So um, I'll start by focusing on the professional learning that has taken place for our high school staff. So we really have three groups of prof uh, professionals who are participating in professional learning. That first group is all high school teachers. The second uh, group is a subset, and that would be um, teachers who we're referring to as our digital learning leaders, and I'll provide more information about them in a minute, and then also um, all of our administrators. And then, uh, and that's uh, for high school. Um, using our district framework for professional learning, which you've seen many times, we provided a summer intensive. There has been other training, and then there's also been formalized training on institute days that has focused on personalized learning. It's focused on transformative learning designs, digital citizenship, the ISTE standards, and classroom management, and also web-based applications. Um, I think that the self-paced tools, if we move over to the green, are being utilized probably more at this time than any other um, initiative or effort that we've led thus far. Um, uh, we have self-paced learning modules that, that have been created within our learning management system for our teachers. The modules have presentations and content developed by our teachers. Um, they have video content from keynote presenters. And then teachers are also, in addition to some of the self-paced modules, utilizing social media and then other tools that are available through the Google uh, Apps for Education to share ideas with each other. Our teachers are also tapping into many open resources on the internet from both professional organizations and other teachers. And then there's also support out there, again, uh, from Google. So then if we move to our goal, which is always the purple, which gets us uh, to job embedded and deep levels of implementation, the job embedded support is being uh, provided by just about everyone in the high school. So I think it's one of those things where everyone is involved in this. So you'll find teachers tapping their neighbor to get that just-in-time support when they either need something or they've heard about something really great that one of their colleagues is doing. But in addition to that, um, our learning support coaches, our technology integration staff, and our digital learning leaders are supporting each other and the teachers in their departments. So let me give you some more information about our digital learning leaders. Um, we have uh, digital learning leaders in each of our departments, so there are 12 at each high school. Uh, these are teachers who are receiving additional training from our Dell consultants and our learning services team. Uh, they have been GAFI certified, and they are providing ongoing support for their colleagues. Um, I have to say that they are an extremely talented, dedicated, and creative group of individuals um, who are also um, creating information and tools and then sharing those through collaborative means. They are receiving coaching from the Dell consultants. They come in and actually coach in their classrooms. They are engaging in reflective protocols. And then they are also a great source of information for providing um, other teachers, but also providing uh, the high school leadership staff and then district leadership staff with feedback about implementation and also their needs. So it's a constant stream of information about their needs. So I'll give you one more <coughs> example with the professional learning. Um, uh, both our uh, learning support coaches, I will say our technology integration specialists have been involved, and then very much our assistant principals for curriculum and instruction. They've organized learning into strands, and so our teachers can uh, select from topics and actually attend the learning, and uh, then they can actually extend that learning later. And then we've had ideas come out of those, like one that was recently implemented, um, which is Passport to Learning where teachers had the opportunity to either sign up to host other teachers in their classroom or they had the opportunity to observe in each other's classrooms. 
And as you can see, as you can imagine, uh, quite a few ideas can be exchanged through that and then further uh, follow-up and contact. So there's been a lot going on with professional learning. And I'm going to turn it over to Roger. Thank you, Dr. Hester. I'm going to start with a high school update. And at the high school level and at all levels that are continuing with digital learning, we've been implementing our professional learning plan, as Dr. Hester outlined, and including the summer intensive sessions as well as the ongoing job embedded training on blended learning, transformative techniques, as well as ongoing um, ecosystem training as well. We're very proud of the effort that learning services and our teaching staff put in on this, this critical aspect of the project because professional development was cited early on as one of the key success criteria of making um, digital learning successful. From a logistical perspective, we set up all the Google accounts as well as Gmail accounts for our high school students. We work with each high school administration to deploy over 6,500 Chromebooks as part of the registration processes at both Naperville Central and Naperville North High Schools the past fall. To prepare for this, uh, IT engaged um, past and present students over the summer to work as interns, and it was a very successful model. There is a video on the website that's a time-lapse video that shows this way faster than we did it. Obviously, uh, it takes about 30 seconds to show most of the process, but it was a, it was a very um, collaborative and productive process, and the students made it very successful. At the junior high level, we again implemented the same professional development plans, configured accounts, deployed about 850 Chromebooks across the grade level teams at every school. The junior high digital learning uh, initiative is expanding. It's, it's increased since uh, last year's pilot to include all schools. And that's going to help us develop capacity, expertise, which will set the stage for successful implementation in the fall. You got it? Thanks. And at the elementary schools, we're also implementing our professional learning plans and we configured accounts. We deployed about 274 iPads and 279 Chromebooks as this level continues along with the initiative and the pilot for specifically the three to five grades in the ecosystems between Apple and Google. Generally speaking, we've also worked with our core team, including the communications department, to populate and further enhance the district web presence around DLI. This will be our ongoing go-to place for information and resources about this initiative and its tailored sections for staff, students, and parents. Here you can find frequently asked questions, request forms, guidelines, technical information, informative videos, etc. We've also set in place our internet filtering for both activity within and at home for our devices. These solutions are provided by two different application solutions. They work very similarly, but they are not identical in their filtering. Very close, but not identical. Uh, at the onset of our initiative, we intentionally set these filter levels to conservative levels, and we are fine-tuning them over time with input from our parents and students. Um, and there's a process by which those uh, filters can be requested to be amended or changed, and that's also on the website. As Kevin mentioned, I was glad to hear him say this, we're implementing the Hapara Classroom Management Tool, and that's a tool that allows teachers to have visibility into the web presence and activities that their uh, students during the classroom and during the day at school are engaging in. We continue to monitor an explosive growth in Google ecosystem applications and educational solutions and review offerings every week for incorporation into our Google Enterprise system and use by our teachers and students. And lastly, our overall support issues have not been materially significant, but can be grouped into the common themes of password management, keyboard and screen repairs. We use our spare stock to make sure the impact to the students is minimal. If they come in with a broken machine, we simply hand them a spare and they're back up and running almost instantaneously. Overall, out of the near 8,000 devices deployed, we've seen 52 screen tickets, 20 keyboard issues. Uh, 50 tickets related to connecting to the internet, which were resolved. We've had one stolen Chromebook and others that were lost yet found after some searching. Um, <laughs> we've only had one broken rep beyond repair so far. So those are really good numbers when you consider the, the, uh, the fleet that we have out there. Um, and we'll turn that back over to Jeff. All right. Um, our next steps are to uh, continue with uh, junior high expansion and the elementary pilot. Uh, the Google ecosystem is simple uh, for usage, but yet it's complex in the multitude of applications, extensions, and tools that it offers. 
So our plans are to continue to learn about the Google apps and the extensions that, so that we can fully appreciate their value and their use. The digital learning planning team has to make a lot of decisions about permissions to specific apps and social media with the high school initiative, the junior high expansion, and the elementary pilot. So we'll continue to monitor the permissions and seek feedback about the decisions that are made and adjust accordingly. We are currently in the process of preparing for the junior high implementation, and actually it's going on now, um, uh, the, the expansion is, but in terms for next year, um, at, which includes our professional learning, uh, the device acquisition, and the deployment, the d deployment plans. The digital learning planning team is collecting data at the 3-5 level so that we can bring a recommended ecosystem and device to the Board of Education, and we're hoping to do that this spring. Our website content continues to grow. I'm not sure if many of you have seen it, but it's a valuable resource uh, for our students, our parents, and our staff as well. And it grows and evolves as we learn from our students, staff, and teachers. So most of it's been built by feedback. We are in the beginning stages of implementing the classroom management tool, Hapara, as uh, Mr. Brunel said. And uh, we are working to roll it out with our high school teachers. And last week, our new help desk, desk system was introduced to all staff. And this dis the system provides a means for staff to submit both requests and then incidents. Okay. Um, in terms of measuring our success, so for our high school and junior high, we conducted an extensive study, as you know, last year to capture the value of digital learning for student learning at all three levels. We also studied the ecosystem and tools. At the high school and junior high level for this year, um, we will focus on collecting feedback from students, from parents, and from <coughs> teachers so that we can understand the, de the degree to which the implementation expectations were implemented and then um, also uh, to learn how to improve for the future. For elementary, we have a lot more information to collect. We still have decisions to make uh, and need to collect extensive data, uh, like, in the full year, uh, like in the full pilot last year. We'll be collecting data on year one implementation expectations within the pilot, the implementation of transformative learning pra practices consistent with, Sa with the SAMR model, and the SD standards. We'll collect information on student engagement. We'll collect information on the parent perspective on student responsibility and we'll seek teacher and student feedback on the value of Google and Apple, Apple ecosystems for grades three through five. Oh, sorry. And then with that, I promised an invitation um, to listen to some teachers and students. So on October 28th in the evening and October 29th in the morning, uh, we will have different sessions where teachers will present how learning has shifted or changed in their classrooms and in the evening of October 28th, we have um, several students coming to share their perspective as well, and um, uh, might possibly have one or two in the morning of the 29th. So um, uh, we hope that you'll be able to make it, and uh, for those watching on the World Wide Web, we hope you can too. And for that, we will open it up for questions and discussion. Okay, excellent report. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Donna? So this is more feedback than questions. Um, I've heard a few things from people in the community, and it's funny because they almost sound like complaints, but they're huge compliments to your program. One was, um, oh, we took a weekend trip, or we took like a road trip, and we couldn't do our homework because we didn't have internet. Which I thought, wow, that's how much we've shifted. You know, which is wonderful that mm -hmm. we're engaging those the. Um, the uh, devices as much as we are. Um, another one was on the same lines. You know, a family had um, internet issues at home, and like their kid couldn't do their homework. <laughs> so I thought, oh my gosh, like that's like I mean, like we've only been doing this for a few months, mm -hmm. and there's yeah. so much of a shift mm -hmm. that's occurred. Um, and then another was that um, my uh, student is now communicating with us in Google Docs, like and sending them to the parents. So mm -hmm. kudos to you guys because I think those are stories you maybe haven't heard, and I think it really is a good picture of how much um, we've, do we've totally dove in. So yeah. thank you for all yeah. you've done. Let me, let me add one thing about working with the Google ecosystem. You are able to work offline. Okay. And there are instructions on the website of how to do that. If you just synchronize up, you can do all the Google apps or at least the Gaffey's core completely offline. And the next time you 
access the internet, it syncs back up and you can submit. So maybe we just need to get that out there a little better yeah, because I'm not sure everybody understands I, Just one observation that. I have, and you guys yeah. maybe can add to yeah. this, is that a lot of the questions that seem to be coming in, either from parents uh, or even students or uh, that you're filtering to us through community members or people that you're hearing, can be answered on the DLI page on the website. Not, I can't, I'm not going to say every question, mm -hmm. but I think it is certainly a great place to start. So if you, if you would refer, if you're hearing, refer them to. Still pass along the feedback that you hear, but I think uh, a lot of the questions um, can at least move students along uh, if you go to that uh, website. Yeah, and I'll say that particular question with accessing when you don't have internet, um, what, what uh, Mr. Brunel just covered was, uh, was covered in the summer intensive, but you know that's a lot of information, so you don't know, mm -hmm. you know how much was retained in that way. It's also available on the self-paced tools, um, but also in the classroom management session, they covered what do you do, what's the alternative when your student doesn't have internet access mm -hmm. and needs it. But I just think that, it you know, just so you understand, mm -hmm. like, I don't think those were complaints at mm -hmm. all. I mean, I think it was the realization from community members that, wow, like, how much this has impacted their classrooms. And I'm sure, that, you know, our students can, can attest to the fact that, uh, you know, every classroom <coughs> is utilizing it to a different level, but to, like, to a huge amount. So mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. That's great. Susan. I would love to hear from our student ambassadors because I know that my my student at home cannot say enough great things about the opportunity to collaborate. Mm -hmm. um, and I do love that it's Google, so I get invitations for our, Go our family Google calendar now, yeah. which is really <laughs> awesome. But I'd love to hear your experience and what you hear in, at school. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Um, yeah, I know I've, it's been a really great resource for me, especially, like, I know I'm going to go home tonight and I'm going to go study for my AP Stats class with a bunch of friends via Google Hangouts. Mm -hmm. And so, like, that's just a really great tool that I've been able to utilize because people aren't, like, available usually until, like, later in the evening when the library's not open, so it's a really great tool in that sense. But also, like, inside the classroom, I don't think there's a single period that goes by where I don't have to pull out my Chromebook. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really interesting because I think I have one notebook this year and it's my math notebook, and then everything else is like, this is my life right now. Um, and so it's been a really great resource for me. I have to say, overall, I've found them to be a very positive impact. Um, as far as how much we use them in class, uh, my teachers don't use them quite as much as Abby's do. Um, some, many of them find them to be very distracting to students, so there are actually several of my classes where we don't use them um, simply because teachers have found that kids get too distracted when they're using them uh, and they just would like their students to stay on task. Uh, as far as feedback from other students, it's been largely positive. Uh, some f few concerns about privacy in terms of uh, what the district can and cannot do with the computers um, and whether or not they can, whether or not that access is limited to at school or at home. Um, but other than that, it's been largely positive. Anyone else? Kristen? Okay, sorry, I'm just getting used to these new microphones. Okay, um, so I wanted to add one story, and I already told Roger, but I do have a student who is participating in one of the pilots, and um, it was super exciting. The first, I think the first day she brought it home, um, she had a project where she had to write a paper with another student and she put the paper on the one side and the student on the other. And they sat there and they had to, they had their document, they could both add to it, they both had their faces, they could see the other face of the other person and I thought, wow, that was collaboration mm -hmm. and, and from afar. And that was, I, I, I think it might have been the first night. That's so great. something, <laughs> seventh grade. So to be able to be able to That's transform good. it in that way and, and so quickly. I will add to Donna's um, mention of the on offline part. Roger showed me a super cool trick about the mobile hotspot on the phone in the car because we do, a t your person that mentioned about the car, I just think perhaps some of us who aren't as tech savvy um, don't know those things offhand, you know, and maybe the teachers do or maybe they assume that the students do, mm -hmm. but some of those tools where you can turn on the hotspot in the car and then they can actually go onto Canvas or do their things, they don't even have to work offline, they can be online in the car, mm -hmm. that was so helpful. So we've gone from putting 
Google Docs on our phone and typing on our phone because that's what we came up with first. But then the, the hotspot <laughs> really, that's really hard. But then the hotspot was super exciting. So that was, that was another really helpful thing. And I, so many kids have phones. So, you know, in terms of the ones that don't have the mobile access, at home with mm -hmm. the with the they have their phones so many of them so anyways I, I thought those were really helpful um, I have heard a couple of I've had a couple different questions and I've heard a couple questions one is with regard to typing so I watched my daughter and she is not super you know mm -hmm. she's still pecking and so I was wondering I was thinking about it in our old life when we were in high school ourselves we took you know senior year or junior year the typing so that we could type fast when we got on our typewriters and I'm just wondering, you know, mm -hmm. are we equipping students, since they are going to be writing so much on their keyboards, with really good typing skills so that they can do that in a way that's effective and works well? Well, and we I, have, I know it's, we're having to do it really early right. because we're starting them so early. Well, and I, th I think that's part of it. So we haven't had the tools readily available. They, you know, did it as a periodic you know, type of thing, but now they have the tools to apply what they're learning. So we do have. Um, something that's called a uh, type master and it it starts in third grade and the students do um, engage in in lessons and they basically can work through them at any pace that are you guys smiling like you remember this um, <laughs> and um, they they can you know self pace through them they can do them at home um, and teachers can also make decisions if somebody is proficient that they don't need you know yeah. to use it one of the things that we do struggle with though is that it creates the basic knowledge in the background but it doesn't really raise them to a level of accuracy and proficiency. Mm -hmm. But again, I think that's because they don't have the tools in front of them to constantly practice um, and be able to do that. So it's something that you know we can continue to work on, but I think our experience and our initiative will help with it. The other thing that I had heard, and it's almost the opposite concern, so I, was, I loved your outline of the year one versus year two. Mm -hmm. I think that um, just based on what I've uh, seen and heard, that would actually probably, um, you know, encompass a, a wide range of the teachers. You know, they probably are at different levels, but that your expectations for year one are different than year two. So right. it's not, we're not expected necessarily to be able to transform lear learning for every single teacher this first year, but that next year you expect to see a lot more of that. So on that substitution part, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I, I wondered about um, was the idea of, okay, now we have our Chromebook, so as a part of our class, we're going to take our notes on our Chromebook. And I heard a concern from an educator about that, and so I paid it a little more attention in terms of the validity, researched it. It does sound like there are some studies about the idea of that synthesis process and the writing, handwriting of the notes. Right. So I just was wondering, you know, what kinds of things you have heard about that, and if you would ca if you would consider cautioning the teachers about using that particular substitution, just given the breadth of um, right. research on it. So let's just take that act of note taking first of all. So when we think of note taking, you know, we generally do it when we're in a consumption type of uh, position. So we are um, we are taking notes because we're listening to somebody. And we're taking them usually for the purpose either to study, to organize the information later, or do something with the information. So if you think about there are criticisms that um, the, the typing is, is rote when it's on the computer, that you're not thinking and processing cognitively. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know, if you think about the things that we're trying to do, and we still need to prepare kids to listen to college lectures and be able to take good notes, um, but if you think about the things that we're trying to do, and if you take that SAMR model, substitution would be replacing, um, uh, you know, uh, handwritten notes with with a, with a laptop or Chromebook, a word processor. Augmentation would be now we've got the added value of having spell check, um, the grammar check, and things that would enhance that process. If we move up to modification, we might actually. Um, have a student, um, you know, take uh, their progress toward a learning target and annotate it, maybe on uh, slides, it could have been a PowerPoint presentation, could have been a reflective conversation, but they were able to document it and save it over time. But if we move to something like uh, redefinition, you would take an app, um, there are many out there, the one that comes to my mind is Explain Everything, um, or you could take another, you could use Media. And you could actually document clips of that student explaining how they're meeting that learning target over time. 
you could put that together in a presentation, put it into a digital portfolio, and then you would have a product that's a documentation of the student's learning over time. But if you also take that act, you know, if you go back to note taking, if you think about um, where can students learn the information through multiple sources, how do they put it together through the use of media writing and then other presentation tools, and then how do they actually share that information or add on to it and create new? So we actually have an opportunity to move way past that interaction. Mm -hmm. So when we help, if we move back to note taking, if we help kids with that and if that is the goal, then we have to help them learn a way to listen to the key features of the message and then document it um, and, and use it in that way. Or we tell them when you're note taking, use your paper and your pencil and use the, you know, use, use the online methods for, for other things. I think that's a really good explanation of the ways that you could utilize notes additionally beyond what you're doing in, in the class. Um, and so definitely with regard to that part of it, you, you would want to see them using that information. The question was more about the, that, that, you know, that synthesis process, which, right. you know, when coached, you would think that you could coach that as well, whether you do it on paper or right. whether you do it as a part of the note, take, the note taking. It was just something that I wasn't aware of before now, mm -hmm. and I just thought was noteworthy for mm -hmm. teachers in terms of that right. synthesis process and the, and the differences of the paper mm -hmm. and, the, and the computer model. Yeah, it gives us a lot to consider, mm -hmm. a lot to think about. Just something, Kevin? Uh, yes, if I may. Um, one of the things I'd like to note about uh, taking notes in school is on the Chromebooks is it's very hard for the teachers to uh, make sure all the kids are on task. Like I know with Harappa, they can see what they're on, but if a teacher is giving a lecture, they may not necessarily be looking at their, uh, their computer and seeing what everybody's on. So I know a lot of times in school when kids are taking notes, they're not actually taking notes. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a concern that's been raised across whether it's note taking or doing other things is, you know, how to use effective uh, classroom management and how do you, um, and it's an issue of an engagement, how is a student engaged enough in the task that they don't wander into other things? Go ahead, Abby. Although I would almost argue that like if a student's willing to like play 2048, let's say, like instead of taking notes, it's not like they wouldn't be playing like tic-tac-toe with their neighbor. Regardless, so. so the distraction would be. I would say it's the same. The distraction still there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, dis the, the distraction is different, and I think yeah. you know to, to Kevin's concern that he brought forward, uh, part of the transformation that has to take place in instruction is with new tools doing things in a different way in the classroom. That's part of the transition that has to make. So if you think about classroom management procedures and things that you do as a teacher, doing it the way you did with paper and pencil, it is hard to identify. Okay, but so you have to rethink, and that's where our teachers are kind of making that transformation with this new tool in this new environment. How does classroom management look different for me? Any other questions from the board? Is the, is the HAPARA being um, implemented across all grade levels or just in the high school and junior high? Starting, starting at the high school and then junior high. Okay. Um, remains to be seen at the elementary level. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we're actually, we're going to evaluate at the high school level this year to see the value in the use. Does it actually support teachers with what Kevin's talking about? And if not, then we really got to consider whether we need it. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, I suppose the distraction on the keyboard is not unlike doodling was uh, back, uh, <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> I remember a few students that I would watch and they would doodle. Not myself, of course. <laughs> Very copious notes. Well, thank you for the, for the instruction. Uh, and I'll pass along to my daughter that you're actually looking at websites and trying to allow more access to the... Uh, right. because there's, she, there's a big, if she has a question, she can put it through on the web form. And yeah, that's what, that's what I've told her. And mm -hmm. actually go back to the teacher, too, as well, to make sure yeah, it gets pushed forward. Absolutely. So maybe a little more emphasis on that for absolutely. students. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next uh, report uh, is on the state report card that we anticipate really soon. So as Tim and Molly come forward, I'm going to try to provide a little bit of context that isn't really captured uh, in the slides that you've seen. Uh, it will be, the context will be captured in Tim and Molly's presentation, but in, in hindsight, maybe some uh, accompanying documentation to help put a little bit of this in context. 
Annually, the, board of, uh, the State Board of Education releases a school report card for each of our schools and our district. Uh, we anticipate that that will be released in about two weeks, that schools may look at these next week, and then they may be available for release publicly the week after that. An interesting thing to note about that is that student performance data and information will not be on the school report card this year because they don't have that back from Park yet. Uh, and we anticipate that, I think, toward the end of November, maybe December, not really sure yet. The school report cards this year will actually be released without the student performance information on them. Uh, another point of context that uh, Tim and Molly may hit on is we don't really know what the report card itself specifically is going to look like. So for reference, in terms of walking you through it, we have last year's school report card, and they will speak to that, and with last year's data, because the point of this presentation is just kind of be familiar to make you familiar with what's going to be on it. What will be released uh, on the school report card, though, is our five essentials climate survey, which we are required to administer every other year. Uh, and so with that information coming out, we wanted to make sure that you are familiar with, one, uh, the information that, is, that will be coming out, and two, just the sense that it is one of the points of measurement that we look at in the school district and that our, our buildings have had this for uh, a while now and have had the opportunity to have some conversations about how the data and what they learn from the assessment falls into their school improvement planning. Uh, but so that's kind of what the context of this is, is uh, when we actually started working on this presentation, uh, we weren't sure exactly when the school report cards were going to come out, but Tim's been able to get some information from the state board that gives us a little bit more of a narrow timeline. Um, and so and knowing that this was coming out, and it, we felt it was important that you just have a sense of what was going to be reported at this time. And so I'm going to turn it over to Tim and Molly to go into a little bit more detail for you. Thank you, Mr. Bridges. I'm here with Molly Farmer, our Director of Research and Analytics. Tonight we would like to share with you information about the state report card. Each year the report card is published in October or November, and we expect them to be provided this coming week to our district and then published a couple weeks later. We are in a difficult position with the lack of data uh, do, from the state testing, but it is our purpose to prepare the board and the community for the documentation and data as it does come out. Our outcomes for this presentation are to review the layout of the state report card, to share the F District 5 Essential Survey data, and to preview the multiple measures index which will go into place next year. Blueprint, com Blueprint Commitment 216A concerns the improvement process. The state report card for each school is a reporting tool on the progress of how our district and our schools improve. The report card will be incomplete this year. The state will be reporting on the data that they have, but since park data is not yet available, some sections will be blank. The sample on the screen is last year's at a glance report card. We assume that this, this year's report card will look similar to last year's. I will guide you on locating the information on the report card by using last year's district report card as a sample. The school report cards are similar, but they include information about programming at each of the schools and also the school's five essential data. The fast facts section on the report card will remain the same. This section includes graduation rate, average class size, attendance rate, and student enrollment numbers. Since assessment data is not yet available from PARC, student achievement and growth measures will be missing. In the past, academic growth was from the grades 4 through 8 on the ISAT. Academic success was measured by the percentage of students who met or exceeded on the state test. It also lists our graduation rate, post-secondary enrollment from the National Clearinghouse, and the Ready for College coursework measured, which comes from the ACT Readiness Score. Student characteristics include the percent ethnicity, low income, English learners, students with disability, and homeless. District finance includes instructional spending per pupil and operational spending per pupil. Student attendance and mobility includes attendance rate, chronic truancy rate, and, st and student mobility. The second page of the district at a glance report card lists the schools in the district with the percentage of students who meet standards. It also lists data re 
related to the achievement gap. In the past, it listed math and reading on the state tests comparing low-income students to non-low-income students. Five essential survey. Okay, sorry. The Five Essentials Survey was the first attempt in the state of Illinois at having more than just academic measures on the school report card. This school climate survey was first created by the University of Chicago and was first given statewide in 2013. Since districts are required to give the survey every other year, the 2015 results are the second set of results that we have in District 203. The different audiences that respond to the survey are parents, certified staff, and students in grades 6 through 12. The survey was taken online last January through March. The schools have had their results since May to inform the school improvement process. Schools and districts are given an executive summary, a full report, a report on all the measures, and a report for each essential. The reports give the percentages for each question's responses. The questions are grouped into measures based on who responded and the topic. The measures are further grouped into essentials. Both the measures and the essentials have a range from 1 to 99. The scales are based on the statewide norms. The responses are looked at based on standard deviations from the average. The scales for both the measures and essentials are then given the labels of most implementation, more implementation, average implementation, less implementation, and least implementation. The pattern for each essential is analyzed for an overall 5E rating, which is supposed to give the likelihood for a school to improve. The possibilities are well-organized, organized, moderately organized, partially organized, and not yet organized. District 203 was given the highest rating of well-organized, which was the same in 2013. Researchers showed that schools strong on three out of the five essentials were ten times more likely to improve student learning. Elementary schools are only rated on three of the essentials, so they have to score well on each one for the well-organized label. Each essential is defined by an overall question. Effective Leaders has questions related to, do principals and teachers implement a shared vision for success? Collaborative Teachers have questions related to, do teachers collaborate to promote professional growth? Involved Families has questions related to, does the entire staff build strong internal external relationships? Supportive Environment has questions related to, is the school safe, demanding, and supportive? Ambitious instruction has questions related to, are the classes challenging and engaging? On this table are the results for each essential for the district. The middle column is from 2013, and the right column is our most recent results from the spring of 2015. We would like to highlight on the next two slides the essential we increased on the most, ambitious instruction, and the one with the largest area for improvement, effective leaders. The district maintained average implementation um, rating from 2013 on effective leaders. This is the only essential that we received the average implementation. The results across the state were very positive for teacher to principal trust. When combining the percent of agree and strongly agree, our results for each question ranged from 82% to 93% with the greater portion from strongly agree. Since the ratings are based on averages when comparing ours to the state, our staff would need to be even more positive to increase our scores. For teacher influence, the questions had a high distribution for some influence instead of a great deal of influence. The question that had the lowest response was on planning how discretionary school funds should be used. The district improved from more implementation in 2013 to most implementation in 2015 on ambitious instruction. The district improved on the three measures of English instruction, math instruction, and quality of student discussion. The measure of academic press was not included in the 2013 results. The area to improve would be where students answered most of the time instead of all of the time. 
Those questions were about the teacher asked difficult questions in class and on tests. Overall, school improvement teams use these results to inform the school improvement plan. This is just one measure that schools use. In the past, our schools were measured on two items, the percentage of students who met or exceeded on the state test, which represented student achievement, and the percentage of students who participated on the test. If the benchmark percentage was not met, the school did not make annual yearly progress. Starting next year, we will have a 70-30 breakdown for accountability, leading to a grade. The details are still be to be determined, but 30% represents the academic measures and 70% represents the district practices. Academic measures include academic achievement, growth measures, which will probably be similar to the growth tables used by the state before this year, and then annual measurable objectives, or AMOs. An AMO could be setting goals for reducing achievement gaps or reducing the percentage of students who do not meet standards. Since this just came out this past summer, we will be learning about how the district practices will be measured. Some of the details in the 2015 legislation includes that compliance will be the measure of how well a district meets the requirements set forth by the state, that evidence-based best practices such as continuous improvement, culture and climate, shared leadership, governance, education and employee quality, family and community connections, and student and learning development. Improved outcomes through local data taking into account will be taken into account in the local context. A state committee will be working on the, to working out the details of how this will be put into practice. Um, in six or seven years, all of the districts in the state will have this in place, with, many, with some of the districts having it in place as early as next year. This will take the place of our previous AYP accountability system. We will now take your questions. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Well, I was one of the ones who was fooled by the, um, the, the original part in terms of the 2013-2014 data that's on the Illinois report, co report card. Um, first of all, I, I did spend tons of time on the, um, on the report card. I love that report card. And, and one of the things that I actually saw as I was Googling, because I was trying to find better data that was 2015 and I couldn't figure it out, um, was that it is really highly rated, our, our report card, in terms of the kind of data that you can find. So I understand what you have um, explained in terms of the park, that you aren't going to have data for some time, um, and that the report card will be released without the data. Um, do you envision when that data comes having a similar kind of presentation for the board where you outline kind of what the report shows? So the last time the state promised that there was going to be a blank section and then they were going to refresh it, I'm not sure they did refresh the actual report card itself, but we will of course present the, um, the testing data when it becomes available. Annually we do. Pre to the Board of Education. We will continue to do that. We have it tentatively scheduled for, I think, the okay. next board. Oh, <laughs> that's right. That's yes. why I'm asking. So, this is the report. Um, um, and then next yeah. next and then, meeting. Yeah. Yeah. So, but okay. um, we, as Molly mentioned, we'll we'll be presenting that as soon as it's available and we can get the data put together. So one of the things that, as I was reviewing the 2013-2014 data, did um, you know it was a great opportunity to remind myself of where we were last year. I guess at, about at this time, um, you know, I did look a little bit at some of the school, pr the growth measures, um, which are of great interest, um, the school um, achievement data, um, the and the academic achievement gap. And while it looked as if we had made some progress, which was exciting, on the um, students who are economically disadvantaged, of course, looking at some of our, our groups like uh, Hispanic students and black students, it was going in the wrong direction, which I know you, I'm sure, pre presented to us last year and were concerned about. So my question is, um, I know when we get that park data, it will probably show gaps, but we will have no measure when we get that park data to be able to say, okay, we were concerned last year, here's what, we, what we've done. And it, and it concerns me to think of two whole years 
before we would be able to say, yeah, we're reassured. So I'm wondering, um, when you are going to present that data to us about PARC, could you also, at least in those concerning areas where we were looking last year, tell us where you think we are getting? Because I know that we don't just use PARC as a growth measure. Mm -hmm. Our teachers use performance series, and we have other kinds of measures, district assessments and others, that say to us, because we wouldn't go two years saying, you know, hmm. <laughs> you know, so I, I just was thinking, as you present to us, because I know we, for example, heard a report last week talking about some student populations, but as you present to us the park data, I know it is likely to show gaps. We just won't be able to say whether there's any difference from last year. It's our benchmark year. I recognize that. So I'm just hopeful that as you do that, that you will also continue sort of the strand for us of where we have been, where you see us being, of course, knowing that that's not statewide data, but just to be able to ensure that we understand the progress that has been made and will continue to be made before we get that second year where we can actually see that progress reflected. Absolutely. And um, actually, Molly and I uh, have already spent some time talking. You well, we reflected back on... Uh, Molly's presentation from this past June, um, where she uh, talked about the performance series and, and kind of the end of the year summary from that, and then the ACT from last month, um, and how those sorts of themes will continue through. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Those are our reports. All right, uh, President's report. Uh, uh, last Tuesday, the board did receive, or a couple weeks ago, at the last, at the DePage ISP dinner, the board did receive the governance award. And uh, we also received the report from uh, Dr. Jacoby from the Illinois Association of School Business Officials on the bleak outlook uh, from the state and potential state funding. So the, uh, the award was nice, and then we had a, a sterling report from Dr. Jacoby. Any other uh, Board of Education reports? Okay, uh, item seven is the monthly reports. Uh, there are four reports contained in there. Are there any questions from the board on any of those reports as presented? Okay, with that, we'll move on to the consent agenda. And uh, Mrs. Price uh, did re re review bills and claims. And I don't have any requests to pull any items off of consent. Are there any requests from the board? For okay, well, and, we'll, and then we'll take the board minutes separately. So I'm going to do this, and then um, I'm not feeling well at all, and I don't want to, like, share, share um, and, or do anything dramatic. So I'm going to go home after this, so I apologize. But um, let me get to that. Then um, I met with uh, finance staff today. My brain is now not working, and uh, everything was fine. It, nobody had any questions. We discussed some things. I was very impressed at some of the things we talked about, for example, if you look on the um, debit card, there's a lot of Amazon. And they've tried to figure out ways to streamline that and to um, consolidate some of the Amazon things, which makes it difficult. They've done it with IT, but the schools have a different situation. But they, it is something that it is nice to hear and heartening to hear that when they're seeing this data come through, they're thinking about it and figuring out ways they can do it better and do the process better. So they're very conscientious and um, thoughtful about it. So I appreciate their time this afternoon. And I move approval of warrant number 402529 through warrant number 403518, totaling $17,355,822.92 for the period of September 22, 2015 to October 19, 2015. And items. Um, uh, 8.02 and 8.0, no, all right, yes, 8.04 and 8.05. Motion, we have a motion in a second for all items on the consent agenda, but items, but item 8.03. Roll call, please, Ms. Bell. Robert? Yes. Roddy? Yes. Fitzgerald? Aye. Watkins? Yes. Yes. Aye. Price? Yes. Fielden? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, item 8.03, uh, the board meeting minutes. And I think we had um, at least one member absent from each. At least two. Yeah, two. One at a time. So we'll, we'll take them one at a time, starting with the, the minutes of September 21st. 
I move approval of the minutes of September 21st as presented. Second. A motion and a second for the minutes of uh, September 21st. Roll call, please, Ms. Bell. Dillon. Yes. Weber. Yes. Wanzi. Yes. Cotton. Yes. Dench. Aye. Fitzgerald. Aye. Price. Yes. Motion carries. I have a motion to approve the minutes of the legislative breakfast meeting. I make a movement, a motion to approve the um, minutes of the legislative breakfast on 918. Second. We have a motion and a second for the legislative uh, breakfast minutes. Uh, roll call, please, Ms. Bell. Robert. Yes. Fielding. Yes. Fitzgerald. Aye. Price. What do I say? Pa what do I Abstain. 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 That's right. Price. Yes. Dench. Aye. Motion carries. And finally, the minutes of October 5th. I move to approve the minutes from October 5th. Second. I have a motion and a second for the minutes of October 5th. Roll call, please, Ms. Bell. Dench. Aye. Price. Yes. Fitzgerald. Aye. Wanty. Yes. Fielding. Yes. Romberg. Yes. Cotton. Motion carries. On to discussion with, without action. Uh, more of policy five. Yes, we'll continue our conversation regarding uh, the policies in Section 5. Uh, we'll, as uh, we typically do, you have a, a memorandum in there regard with a brief overview of uh, proposed changes. Uh, Kane will walk through each of them one by one. Before we begin, though, uh, I think uh, administration at this point would like uh, to pull 5.330. Uh, we had a conversation late this afternoon that we want to take a closer look at that one. Uh, so we'll bring that one back at a future time. Uh, there are some things in there that, uh, to be consistent with other policy we've looked at, maybe we want to look at that a little bit closer. Uh, so we will not be asking for conversation. We'll not have conversation item 5.330 to have an opportunity to look a little bit closer at it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ridges. So the first one up for discussion only tonight is 5.280, um, teaching assistants, coaches, bus drivers. It just reorganizes the headings and the content to better reflect the work of these respective positions. Um, you can see here what those new headings are and the descriptions for the work under those headings. Um, it's really a, a reorganization and rewording to better reflect what's currently going on for those positions in the district. Any questions from the board on 5.280? Okay. Next one is 5.285, drug and alcohol testing, school, bus, and commercial vehicle drivers. Um, really, it eliminates the existing policy and stipulates that the district policy will adhere to all state and federal statutes, um, stipulates the policy and procedures are not implemented until district hires staff requiring CDLs. Um, and so it reduces it to a simple paragraph that basically directs us to adhere to state and federal law and aligns the appropriate statutes. Any questions from the board? Jackie? Um, if I could just ask for clarification, I think we talked about if um, medical marijuana, I think um, Carol talked about that, that that would not be something we would be able, if if there was an employee, medical marijuana would not be something, um, if that would not be something that would be acceptable uh, within our current rules and regulations if it um, affected their behavior at work, correct? That's correct. I'm trying to make sure I understood that correctly. It's not behavior. It's if they're using it because it's zero tolerance for bus drivers, correct? Correct. Okay. Well, it would be impaired driving, right? I mean, impaired driving, yeah. drug driving. Yeah. Under the influence. Any other, any other questions on that in this policy? Okay. 5.290, employment suspension termination for support staff. It eliminates the unnecessary steps details, um, especially because it refers to the appropriate CBAs. It stipulates the rights of the superintendent in regards to suspension. Um, it also includes for uh, support personnel not covered under CBAs, uh, just the details regarding um, reduction in forces and recalls and uh, procedures related to those. Any questions, Kristen? I just had a question about um, how the seniority list um, section in terms of the reduction in force, was, this, was the reduction in force 
enforce and recall. It's the renamed section. Um, it recommends that, or it, it's, it outlines that the board uses a seniority list to determine the order of dismissal and removal. And it just was a question I had in terms of how that relates to what we do with teachers as to um, whether or not the evaluation of teachers. I, I thought I remembered in my board training three years ago the new changes in the state law that allowed for evaluation to be a component in terms of um, when you're doing RIFs. Um, is that similar with regard to this category of employees, and how is that similar or different? Um, it's very different. So for, for teachers, um, yes, that law passed, and, and it really goes by the evaluation rating, and it's called a sequence of dismissal list, mm -hmm. and everything is prescribed by law. So our last collective bargaining agreement, the way that it was written is that it was all streamlined so that um, it really um, defers to the school code. and. and um, and it's very simple, and that's what we do. But this is okay. very different. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, Kane, go on to the next one. Uh, policy 5300, educational, uh, educational support personnel, um, schedules and employment year, re revises the references to the CBAs. It outlines parameters for the superintendent when setting schedules and calendars, including alignment with state and federal statutes. Um, and the policy and the statutory references are um, revised. Jackie? Kane, I'm sure this goes without saying, but this is all consistent with the collective bargaining agreement, correct? Correct. In okay. fact, it's references to them at the beginning. Well, I saw the reference at the beginning that. and I saw the reference at the end, but yeah. I just wanted to make sure, you know, as you, if as you read the text, nothing seemed to jump out at me, but then again, I wasn't proofing them against each other either. So, no. And the CBAs would guide and related to those issues as they oh, you know, okay. are agreements that define the year uh, anyway. So, any other questions? 5.300? Okay. Uh, 5.320. Uh, just a sec. I might have misordered my paperwork here. 5.320 is um, educational support personnel again it's on evaluation it assigns ultimate responsibility for support staff evaluation program to the superintendent or designee identifies select standards for evaluation and includes the appropriate cross references and of course it refers first to the appropriate collective bargaining agreements any questions from the board okay All right, so you bring those back um, November 2nd. Correct. Very good. Blinking. Um, uh, <laughs> the, uh, specifically, I noticed most of the others had a statement like the next one did, like uh, 320. Mm -hmm. uh, for those, basically something to the effect, for those not covered by the above agreements, then it goes on. The one that uh, Jackie pointed out, the um, uh, schedules and employment year, doesn't clearly say that. And I, I was just wondering, yeah. I think all the others actually said that. Yeah. For people covered by these agreements, hey, this counts. For everybody else, the rest of this counts, which I know is the intent. Right. But I wonder if one line that said that, like the, the following agreement does say that. It says, yep. for all employees not covered by these agreements. That's what made me notice it. Because it's missing. Yeah, you're correct. I'll, I'll review I that. I think it would be sure. helpful for yep. a first-time reader. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments then on 9.01? All right, then we'll move on to uh, discussion with action. And we have uh, policies that we read last meeting. Uh, up for approval. We have one that we would like to discuss a little bit. Yes, the first one, 5.90, abuse and neglected child reporting. Um, actually, uh, originally you'll recall that we're, this is the third reading, and one of the reasons is because it was brought up about the definition of hazing that was in here originally, and it wasn't aligned with 7190. And so we went back and re revised it. And in the interim, um, our board rep, Kevin, has had a chance to look at it and actually did a little research on his own. He took interest in what that was saying. And so 
Um, I'd like to have Kevin share what sort of he contacted me about with this policy and this definition. Uh, just share what your insights were, and I'd like to talk about how that might be incorporated in this. Um, the, set, the part of the board policy that I w uh, was concerned about and that I'll be talking about is the very first sentence of what refers to hazing. It reads, any district employee who observes any act of hazing that does bodily harm to a student must report that act to the building principal, superintendent, or designee who will investigate and take appropriate action. So one of the things that, if you recall, when I, um, I asked about this last meeting is how it limits the uh, reporting of the hazing to only hazing that causes bodily harm. And I did some research on, on this side and found that across the board, uh, many institutions define hazing and have their policies concerning hazing to include hazing that's uh, both physical and psychological hazing. Uh, that Those institutions range from universities like Cornell and University of Massachusetts to the US Army. Um, also, it, uh, similar definition is also in uh, New Hampshire state statute concerning hazing. So one of the, the two, there are two parts that I'd like to make a suggestion about. One is it's man, the mandate of when a district employee must report hazing. Um, currently, it's who observes any active hazing, and I was suggested that it be changed to who, who observes or has knowledge of an active hazing in order to make it more comprehensive if a district employee doesn't actually see hazing but knows that it's going on. Uh, the second part is to change it from an active hazing that does bodily harm to an active hazing that does bodily or psychological harm uh, to cover both aspects. I discussed these pr uh, suggestions with my principal, Principal Weisbrook, and he was also in agreement that uh, they, they would improve the policy. And if I could just add one thing, and going back and looking at 7190, item 9 that talks about hazing, um, uses the definition that we put in there based on our last discussion, but it does say um, in the beginning of it, in the beginning of that uh, paragraph, hazing aggressive or demeaning behavior that does or may result in physical, emotional, or psychological harm. So there is a connection that it makes to psychological harm, but it doesn't explicitly define hazing as psychological. It defines it as something that ca you cause somebody to perform an act. It does point out, though, that there might be psychological harm from that act. So I think Kevin's observation is not an inaccurate one to make at all. Mike, go ahead. I know where it's right. Hearst brought this up a couple, or a month, three meetings ago, I guess it was. Um, this was actually what I was referring to, and I wonder why we don't use that exact language. Anybody that observes, boom, hazing, aggressive, or demeaning behavior that does or may result will, you know, use it verbatim out of our uh, policy. Yeah, what, yeah, what we did before, and we can certainly do that and revise it, is we, we took the second part that defined hazing. Yeah, I saw that one change, yeah. Yeah, um, because that's what I understood our conversation to be around, and also, the way it the way it does it is it it defines hazing one way and then re defines the results of it as a series of other things and we can certainly put that in there that way. Um, or oh, are you talking about all nine? Yeah. Okay. It just further defines hazing as a specific type of behavior for um, induction into admission in groups and organizations or society. It mm -hmm. really doesn't take anything away from the first statement though. No, it, it doesn't. I wasn't suggesting that it yeah, takes okay. anything away from it. Because this would actually um, uh, force reporting of bullying, too. Yeah. We, we I believe, already have that. I, I know, have but to, yeah. Yeah. it would also cover yeah. aggressive behavior, it would right. demeaning behavior. Right. Um, and, and part of the conversation before is one of the reasons we didn't put it in here. You know, again, the original, um, this portion was originally written by our attorney. Um, and so we took their direction, and also we have harassment and bullying policies, and staff are required to report harassment and bullying also. So this wouldn't be any different? N no, this wouldn't be any different. So you've had a recommendation come forward. I guess what we'd look for, I, I, I think, you know, Kevin brought up some good points that we'd like to look a little bit closer at and, and look at some of the language. Um, so our recommendation is that we would pull this one. We do a rewrite, 
incorporate some of the, the recommendations in that we've heard and then bring this back next time. Yes. Any comment? Everybody agree? Jackie? Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, thank you, Kevin. And also, I, I like the wording where it doesn't, we, you don't have to pass the psychological damage threshold to have it be reported. I would hate, you know, there's, there's a lot of other things that can be harmful um, in hazing, whether it be physical or not, um, that don't have to pass that. So I think that makes sense too. So awesome. Thank you. It's great research. I'm glad, I'm glad you took the time to do it. and. Uh, self-directed yourself to go to the principal and so forth to make it happen, so it's excellent. It is, it's a great chance for you to interact in the process and thank you for doing it. Okay, so uh, any of the questions on any of the remaining policies? We can take them in one motion, excluding 5.90, if that's okay with the board. Let's take them in the, uh, let's take, make the motion as approve uh, policies and just list them just so that we're clear in the minutes. We can do that. And who wants to make the motion? I'll make a motion to approve policies numbers five point five point one eight five, five point one nine zero, five point two hundred, five point two five zero, five point two six zero, and five point two seven zero as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve item ten point oh one as stated. Roll call, please, Ms. Bell. Aye. Yes. Fitzgerald? Aye. Fielden? Yes. Dench? Aye. Wanky? Yes. Robert? Yes. Motion carries. In the last meeting, you received uh, a report to the membership from the Illinois Association of School Boards and the, per the recommended um, resolutions for consideration at the delegate assembly uh, on the November 21st meeting. Uh, we've had an opportunity to review them. Find no reason to disagree with the recommendations from the resolutions committee. And again, uh, Mr. Fielden sits as a representative on that committee and allow him to speak to it if there's any questions too. I, I have a question for Mr. Fielden and his role as the, um, the legislative um, side. Um, was there any more discussion? The one, this is the uh, reaffirmation of the existing position, so I don't know how much you actually talk about this, but yeah. the one that always is near and dear to my heart. Um, is number five, and for those of you, it's the report to membership. It's in um, its item. The resolutions are 10.02 um, in board docs, but the uh, financing public school uh, education state number five, state authorized charter um, school funding. I'm very much in support of what um, IESB is recommending. They're recommending um, do adopt, but it's basically saying, you know, we have to have. Um, exactly, and just because someone leaves our leaves our school system doesn't mean that um, uh, you know for all the reasons I don't need to go in all the was there any more discussion about it or it is still highly supported I guess is what I'm I'm it's hoping it's still it's still highly supported okay. I mean uh, Woodland 50 would typically come and make a speech uh, for this but they chose not to come this year okay. which was unusual but. Um, it's still very I much just supported. wanted to make sure it was still getting the strong oh, yeah, support. It, so it, great. It's got, it's got the support it needs, and it's I think it's at the top of the list as far as uh, a legislative push, but it's not you know, just awesome. these Thank you. Right. I will make a motion to approve item 10.03, the ISB re resolutions. 10.02. Um, nope. Oh, 10.02. Sorry. Had my cursor over that. Is there a second? Second. Sorry. We have a motion and a second for item 10.02 as presented. Roll call, please, Ms. Bell. Robert? Yes. Dench? Aye. Fielden? Yes. Fitzgerald? Aye. Wonky? Yes. Potty? Yes. Motion carries. IESB delegate. Okay, and then now that uh, you as a board have chosen the position but you, which you would like your delegate to take uh, at the delegate assembly, uh, last board meeting we had a board member uh, volunteer to serve as the delegate, so we'll need a motion to uh, designate her as your delegate. A motion, I make a motion to uh, designate Donna Wonke as the ISB delegate as contained in item 10.03. Second. I have a motion and a second to not, uh, send Donna Wonke as a delegate for the District 203 board. Roll call, please, Ms. Bell. Robert? Yes. Dench? Aye. Fitzgerald? Aye. Yes. Wonke? Yes. Gillen? Yes. Motion carries. All right. You wear a big hat and sash. <laughs> just that, after, just after we're discreet, I wanted to let you, you know. 
you, you do get a ribbon and you do get a nice certificate when you're done. And they want you to they want you to return your voting placard when you leave. They're, they're very strict on that. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your support. And you get a nice pen too. So excellent. All right. Uh, okay. Item eleven: new business. Any new business? Any old business anybody wants to discuss? Okay, we have the uh, upcoming schedule of events, and we're t t uh, two items for the Focus 203 that were mentioned. I would highlight the, the Focus 203 sessions uh, that were referenced in the DLI update, and then also one of my favorite events of the year, uh, the Veterans Day Breakfast on November 11th, and the significant events that will be taking place in our schools uh, in honor of our veterans. Very good. Okay, the Board of Education is going to go back into closed session um, I mean, to discuss... Um, we're going to go back in for personnel, not litigation. With Add minutes. I'm getting approved minutes. Okay. Minutes. Add minutes. Add minutes to your thing. Okay. And we'll, go, we'll, do, the, okay, we'll do the minutes. I'll read them all. Yeah. Just do it. <laughs> Just I don't want to go through. Okay. So to go back in closed session for discussion of lawfully closed, closed meeting minutes for the purposes of approval by the body of the minutes or semi-annual review of the minutes as mandated by Section 2.06. Appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district or legal counsel for the district. Litigation when an action against affecting on our behalf of the particular district has been filed and is pending before a court, tri a court or administrative tribunal. The sale or purchase of securities and investments or investment contracts. Security procedures and the use of personnel and equipment to respond to an actual, a threatened, or a reasonably potential danger to the safety of employees, students, staff, the public, or public property, the setting of a price for sale or lease of property owned by the district, collective negotiation, negotiating matters between the district and its employees or their or their representatives. Second. We have a motion a second. Go back into close. Roll call. Uh, Robert. Yes. Yes. Aye. Fitzgerald. Aye. Blanke. Yes. Fielder. Yes. Patty. Yes. Motion carries. We're enclosed. And when the board returns, there'll be no more action. We'll just uh, adjourn. Thank you.